time we were looking at uh, random testing. And um, so we tried to uh, look at uh, some of the questions related to random testing. And incidentally, uh, some of the questions uh, perhaps apply even when random testing is not random. And there's a key question uh, when you are testing, uh, your achievement is measured in terms of uh, uh, coverage or finding defects. And uh, if you do random testing, after applying a certain number of random uh, tests, uh, what is that you have achieved? And um, so basically in random testing, uh, one uh, concept we saw was uh, detectability profile. And uh, there we saw that uh, you have far the very different uh, detectability values. Where detectability is the probability that you, if you will apply a randomly chosen vector, then uh, um, the probability that the bug will be detected. So there are some forms with uh, fairly high detectability, and this will be found earlier. And then the challenge in the later part of testing, and that is when, we, when you are approaching high reliability, would be uh, to find hard to test forms. Now there are some uh, uh, results uh, that uh, software engineers have uh, uh, thought about. For example, where do the faults uh, tend to hide? And uh, so some of the things that they have found that, that sometimes uh, some of the software uh, defects, they have to do with uh, uh, some of the software defects that are hard to find, they have to do with uh, uh, cases that uh, would uh, be encountered in some very special situations. For example, when there's a certain combination of rare inputs. So, and uh, however, uh, testing for hard to test faults uh, would uh, impact the reliability quite a bit when you're approaching high reliability. And we uh, last time talked about some of the implications of the detectability profile. So for example, when you do fault seeding, uh, you have to keep in mind that fault seeding seeds a fault, seeds faults with some typical uh, detectability values, perhaps a range, uh, uh, they range within a narrow range and perhaps they say their detectability values uh, would uh, look like a. Um, uh, let me show a graph here. Here is uh, detectability. And here is the number of faults. So if a software that has been tested to some extent, so here is the detectability high. So this is high detectability and this is low detectability. So typically in software, you will find a detectability profile which is like this. More faults that are hard to find and fewer faults that are easy to find. Now if you will inject some faults, the, the faults injected would tend to be uh, like this. So they would not have exactly the same detectability, but depending on the approach used, they would be in some range, but it would be a, a range, it, it would be, uh, it may, their distribution may look like a bell-shaped curve. Whereas uh, farts that, uh, the real farts that are in the software may have a distribution of uh, something like this. Now this is something that I was thinking of experimenting with. I have looked at uh, some of the plots that some of the researchers have uh, come up with. And they have, so you can see 
the rate of detectability varies when uh, they are injecting some faults. And to me, they sort of look like this. But that is something that is, uh, would be worth uh, investigating. Perhaps uh, uh, somebody would uh, work on this question and uh, maybe uh, work, give us more insight. Any questions on random testing and the detectability profile? Okay, so now let's look at software reliability. We have started looking at software reliability last time. And uh, last time, I had uh, compared the field of uh, hardware reliability versus software reliability. Hardware reliability, as I was mentioning, is, uh, uh, is, is a well-established field. Software reliability is somewhat new. It's not that new. So for example, uh, the International Symposium on Software Reliability Engineering. So I'm going to go to it uh, week after next week. Yes. And that is a number, uh, is it uh, what? 20 or 20 seconds, something like that? Yes. So it is something like that. So it has been around for, so that conference has been around for about 20 years. I, I, I forget the exact number. Uh, I have most of your proceedings. Uh, and uh, and even before that, people have worked on it. But it's still relatively new compared with hardware reliability, where there's a lot of work done, well-established methods. But I think, potentially, a software quantitative methods for software reliability can be just as valuable, if not more, for software reliability. Now keep in mind that the methods are statistical, so nobody can guarantee that if you make a prediction, it is going to be true exactly. But over a long period, that means if you make a few predictions, in general, if you are using good methods, your predictions should be uh, 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 quite valuable. So last time I was mentioning about uh, static versus dynamic modeling. Incidentally, I think I had mentioned the, uh, let's see. Okay, here is the eraser. I was mentioning about the term model. So when we say uh, uh, something is a model, uh, that means it uh, attempts to capture certain behavior. But it is still a model. So a model cannot capture every possible uh, uh, detail. But uh, for a given uh, uh, thing that you want to model, hopefully a model will, will give you uh, an answer that uh, would uh, answer some of your questions. For example, if you are uh, managing a project, how much more testing you should and uh, the answer to that question may come uh, through uh, using a model. And st for uh, static uh, models, I was uh, mentioning about the uh, use of uh, static metrics. Static metrics are those that uh, you can uh, usually measure even before you start testing. So for example, you can uh, measure number of lines of code. Uh, you can uh, measure uh, other things. Uh, you can uh, measure modularity. You can measure uh, cohesion. You can measure uh, coupling. You can measure, uh, there, are, uh, quite, uh, there are perhaps several dozen uh, metrics that have been proposed and examined by people. And sometimes some of the metrics are proposed for special situations like metrics for object-oriented programs. But basically, uh, uh, static metrics. And uh, nature of the software, the language in which uh, you are uh, uh, developing a program, so those would be uh, static information. 
And then you have uh, dynamic modeling. And in case of uh, dynamic models, you have the reliability growth models. And the idea is that as you keep debugging, the reliability grows, and how the reliability should grow is described by a software reliability growth model. And they are sometimes referred to as software reliability growth models. And then you can have some coverage-based models. So if you achieve some certain coverage, what can you say about the reliability or defect density of the software? Okay, so now let us consider the question of what factors control defect density. software developed would have some uh, bugs in it and the number of bugs uh, would depend on a number of factors and it would be really useful if you can associate these factors with uh, the defect density so that if you are a manager you can if you have control over these factors you can try to control them or you can try to estimate the defect density by knowing something about the factors and uh, so we need to know that for um, to estimate uh, initial defect density. And uh, process improvement. How do you then potentially improve your process? Now there are uh, uh, a, uh, a few different models that have been proposed and uh, one, uh, the common approach is that you identify different factors and you make an assumption that these factors, they have an additive effect. That is one assumption. So the models are of two types, so there are additive models. Which is incidentally uh, fairly uh, popular because there are some uh, standard uh, statistical methods that will allow you to do that. So for example, you could do some statistical thing that will say that 5% uh, of the vari uh, variation is explained by this variable and so on. So there, there, there are some additives. So for example, there is a model by Takahashi and Kamayachi. And basically, uh, defect, let us say D is defect density. The defect density is some linear combination of some factor F1 and some factor F2 and some factor F3 and so on. And there are some statistical methods available that will allow you to estimate these uh, parameters. And then there are some uh, multiplicative models. And uh, there are several multiplicative models. So they are used both in hardware and software. So for example, uh, in uh, software, uh, for software uh, cost estimation, there is a model called Kokomo model. How many of you have come across that? Kokomo model. It's a famous uh, model used to estimate software cost. And there are other uh, models. 
For example, the hardware model I was mentioning about uh, Bayesian handbook 217 that uh, tries 